So now that we've gotten ourselves acquainted with primates, let's finally start to talk about evolution. And when we're talking about evolution, one of the words that comes up is called deep similarity. So to talk about deep similarity, we're first going to talk about what is evolutionary biology, because now we're kind of entering a very specific field with a really deep history, and it's trying to look at a lot of time when we're talking about evolutionary biology. Next, we'll talk a little bit about classification and how we understand how different things are related to each other. Um, and lastly, we'll come back to this idea of deep similarity and why we're bringing it up now. So in biology, there are a lot of different subfields, as you can see here, microbiology, botany, zoology, bioethics, also really important, taxonomy, evolution, and all of the other things you see here. But I like to think of it in a little bit more simpler terms. So within biology, there's really two different paths in my mind. First is molecular biology. And this is, we are looking at the molecular basis of what's going on in cells. The other hand, and this is what I deal in, is evolutionary biology. So we're thinking about the processes, these evolutionary processes, for why we see so much different life out today. If you remember back to the very first lecture in this series, we thought about the difference between proximate reasoning and ultimate reasoning. And it comes down to this dichotomy here. Proximate reasoning, or the very immediate cause for what's going on, that's within the realm of molecular biology. Ultimate reasoning, that's evolutionary biology. We're trying to talk about the why something evolved in the first place, rather than how it actually works. So we can bring this back to this diagram here. And these fields up at the top, those are all within molecular biology. And everything down here, that's within evolutionary biology. So you can already see there's a lot of different little things. Um, I would like to point out that bioethics is really within both of them in different ways. Um, and genetics really does span the boundary because we use genetics a lot when we're talking about evolutionary biology. In evolutionary biology, we have a couple big questions we ask. First, how are living organisms related to each other? Here, we're looking at the animals and other living organisms that exist right now, and we're trying to figure out how are they related? Because there are a lot of similarities we see, and that does strongly imply that there are relation meaningful relationships between them. And second, if we know that all of the life out there is related somehow, how did it evolve over time? So here, it's more than just looking at what's alive today. We're looking at the evidence we have for previous species, the fossil record, and trying to figure out how we think these species came to be in the first place. There are many different representations of the uh, evolutionary history. Uh, this one is particularly fun because you can see that it radiates out and shows time. So you can see that some branches are very, very old, but many branches are much, much newer. So if you look at the rings, only a few branches go all the way to the center. And as we get farther and farther out, we have more and more branches showing that there are more different lineages of living organisms alive the closer we get to today. Um, there is a lot of information on this tree here, but you can see that bacteria are the oldest. Next is archaea and eukaryotes, and mammals are all the way at the other end. We're relatively recent when we're talking about all life. When we're talking about all of this, though, it is helpful to talk about biological classification because um, how we name things helps us organize it so we can understand it better. We've been talking about this a little bit already when we were talking about the different groups within primates. Now let's get a little bit bigger. So here we have organisms are nested into progressively smaller groups. It's just like the file folders that you can organize on your computer desktop. You can have one folder, and then you can have a folder inside that, and you have another folder inside that. And you can see here, um, the biggest um, section here is life. Everything fits within life. Next, we have a domain, then kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species is the smallest level here. It is important when you're using this classification, make sure you know what level you're talking about. 
you don't want to compare a species with an entire class. Those are two very different levels of organization. Um, if it helps, here's my favorite uh, uh, mnemonic, mnemonic, one of those things um, to help remember the order of these. It's keeping precious creatures organized for grumpy scientists. Um, so we start with the, this one is inverted from the last slide, but kingdom is the largest one here. This one happens to omit domain, um, then phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Um, just a reminder that when we are talking about a scientific name for a living species, we use binomial nomenclature. So we were only using the last two names within that system. So this was created by Linnaeus, and we have that genus and species both italicized, our generic epithet and our specific epithet. And here are a couple of examples. Homo sapiens, Tarsius tumpara, and Panpaniscus. So what we do here is we only use the last two names within that classification scheme, because otherwise you have a really long name to talk about. And this is one of the ways that we simplify that. But we always know that uh, we never reuse a genus name somewhere else. So if you see a genus name, you can then look up where else it falls within the uh, broader hierarchy of living things. So now that we've talked a little bit about what evolutionary biology is and gotten ourselves reacquainted with classification, let's tackle this idea of deep similarity. Deep similarity is this idea that there's a unity of composition between all living things. That if you go back farther enough, there are a basic body plan or some similarities between all living creatures. When we're talking about all life, literally everything. This means DNA as our hereditary material. Every living cell uses DNA for our hereditary material. Um, also, cellular structure. Every living creature uses cells. Um, and also the central dogma of molecular biology. We have DNA, we transform that into RNA, and we put that and put make it into amino acids. This is the uh, central procedure that all living creatures use. Um, but we can also use the term deep similarity and not go quite all the way back. We can compare ourselves to different organisms as well. So if we want to compare and maybe make a percentage out of it, um, we're about 99.9% .9 similar to other humans. So all of us, even though we like to discriminate based on skin color and other things, we are very, very similar to each other. When we're comparing ourselves to chimpanzees, we're about 98% similar. Cats are 90. Mice are 85%. Cows are 80. Fruit flies are 61%. Oddly, chickens are 60%. And bananas are about 60%. You might think it's a little bit weird that we are um, a little bit more similar to fruit flies than chickens. I think this has says a little bit more about just how weird chickens are than anything else. And keep in mind that these percentage um, estimates uh, are gross oversimplifications of other things that might be going on. So I wouldn't take these too seriously. Just use this as a marker for about how similar we are to different things. So, Rather than just compare ourselves to the species that are living today, we also like to look at the fossil record because this can help us understand how things came about to be. This is one of my favorite uh, visualizations of the fossil record. The thing that's closest to us is right now. And the farther back you go on this spiral, the farther away you are from the present, the farther back in time you're going. And you can see we actually get less and less life. So we, this shows you that as time has gone on, we have more different forms of life that have evolved. When we're talking about the fossil record, we're talking about these periods. We start with the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and Tertiary. So keep in mind, there's actually a lot of time that happened before most of the fossil record that biologists talk about. Sorry, geologists. We really just care about when animals live. That's our fault. Um, biologists tend to call everything that happened before the Cambrian the Precambrian, even though the Precambrian is so much longer than everything else we talk about. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff that happened there. It just, you know, didn't have much to do with living creatures. 
Um, but let's talk about how life evolved or how life came to be in the first place. So we think about 40 billion years ago, billion years ago, so the Earth had been around for, you know, about half a billion years at this point, we have a couple different things floating around in this primordial soup in the early Earth. So we have some amino acid precursors, some nucleotide precursors, and all of them came together to create what we think were the first proto-biological uh, molecules. Um, the, one of the prevailing th theories right now is that called the RNA world theory is that actually before we had DNA-based um, cells, we actually had RNA-based organisms. Um, this is because there are so many different forms of RNA out there, and RNA can actually do stuff. DNA is really cool in many ways, and it's great at storing hereditary material, but other than that, it's actually pretty boring. DNA is pretty much only a storage mechanism. So RNA provides a really um, interesting pathway for it to actually create organisms and uh, uh, bind things together or cleave different molecular bonds. Um, here is a simplified graphic that makes it a little bit easier to understand. So we, we have shown that RNA can self-replicate if it is a little bit of inefficient. Um, and it can create a wide variety of different things. Eventually, we go into an organism that now has DNA as its storage mechanism rather than RNA. So now we have something that's a little bit more reliable on the storage end, but we can still take advantage of the flexibility of RNA leading to the life that we know today. You might remember our levels of biological organization. Everything up until here isn't alive, but when we put it all together and have a cell, now we finally have a living organism. As a reminder, these are all of the things that go into um, life that we know today, growth, reproduction, cells, metabolism, homeostasis, heredity, and responding to stimuli. So now that we've talked about all these, these things, and we're going to go more in depth into evolution and how we think life um, unfolded across the earth, can you explain? What does evolution try to explain? <laughs> 